worst, you know, good memes come out of it. <laughs> you laugh. Oh, I was on that bed. All right, here we go. Hello. Hello, world. <clears throat> Occupado. All I wanted to sit there and say is like, you know, Brandon Grant lost round one to a South player. I'm really happy. I love Brandon. Brandon was great playing against ATC and he's a cool human being. He is a machine, yada yada, but it was so pleasing. I heard that he lost. Who did he lose to? To uh, Ruben Fernandez, my ATC teammate, and he's down in Miami. Oh, okay. So that was that was a big shakeup. Like immediately after like the results got put in, I went there and like Chandler was gonna list of all the South players that are going and they're like, okay, cool. I'm like, look, a South player beat you know, like the reigning champ for two years in round one. This is good momentum. How's he ended up doing so far after that? Um afterwards he lost to uh Thomas, is it Oakley or something like that? I don't quite know his last name, how to pronounce it. Uh, he's played Lennon, John Holmes. Uh, he lost to John Lennon for his first loss this round. And it was a it was a tight game. It's very cagey. Um, he's running Mono Blood Angels. So... Are they? Cool. There is two like almost mono blood like one mono blood angels and one almost mono were that were undefeated after day one that were pretty interesting. Like I think the reason why is because like they take like they they have the ability to fight all the other marines and just punch them off the board and just be super aggressive before the combat doctrine is online. Oh, so, for the assault doctrine. And to top it off, like tremor shells doesn't work on Sangri Guard or Death Company. Like they're yeah. both running units of Sangard and Death Company. That's a good idea. Because that list has a lot of aggro. Ugh. So, what else? Like, I don't, like, like I said, I'm just improv this. So, what else is it? What are we going to be doing to, talking about tonight? Oh, well, yeah, you, I, got, you got yeah, some new I, news, right? You got to break the news. I wasn't there on Monday to hear the news. You weren't. You said. <laughs> I know. I've been missing. I had so much work going on. But so, yes, yeah, you're a sponsored guy. And... Like, what's up with that? Um. Yeah, so we've come down and we talked about, like, goals and so forth. And Obey Alliance and us have been, you know, on the, you know, we're just trying to sit there and say, like, coming down to what we both want and we're both making sure that we can achieve this and being realistic but also you know mature at the same time and we're going to be making most of the first beginning part is making content and um later you know this idea that we were thinking about was going also like traveling around and doing some commentating too would oh. be good but setting up like a you know a streaming you know both streaming and like answers and questions type stuff and um I'm trying to sit there and say, like, a little bit of educational things, like, I want to sit there and have, like, say here, like, here's a tier list of, like, mo of board control type units, or codexes, and ranking them by, like, mass amount of board control, like, having a huge amount of models by volume, or mobility, or just by, just resiliency, such as, like, custodes, like, they hold an objective, you're not taking them off that objective easily. Um, and doing stuff like that, and having, like, probably, like, we're talking about having like two nights for streaming and the idea is we're going to do a little later in the night and that's mostly it like that's really kind of the basic of what we're going for right now kind of image i guess more like a tabletop tactics but for competitive players so is it battle reports or just talking is it live uh, or what, is it like youtube we're gonna do both we're gonna do both in the beginning but it's easier to stream games and talk about and like show things and then later, yeah, you know, make making more battery port type things. 
Mm-hmm. Cause like battle reports require a lot more like put, you know, effort put into them. Yeah, editing. So we can spend like, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I'm looking for someone else to help teach and show us how to do that. <laughs> Cause that's something I do not know how to do at all. Okay. Cool. I'm, I'm kind of a blunt when it comes to technology. Like, I am a natural born brute. I just know how to, like, I'm building the table, the shelves, getting everything, like, set up. And, like, I'm a hands on guy. I just look at buttons. I'm just like, what am I supposed to do with this? Appreciate it. We're getting a lot of, like, I know, I haven't been able to talk to Richard about it as much, but I know we've both been getting a good amount of, uh, just congratulations, you know, we're gonna see what comes of it and so forth like that, and the other thing is just, um, try something to say, words, English, um, was well, mostly just a lot of people wanting to know more on what does, what does this open up for, what does, what is this full on sponsorship, you know, and being being a part of an esport organization mean for the game like how does what does what direction is this going to take it yeah so what's your answer to that when they ask you this question um mostly again making it a little bit more for me like i've been having to say it like just making it more mainstream making it where like <laughs> this isn't as an elite community as it has been in the past because like that's one thing is like it's kind of like when you get into some of these retro game gaming like um organizations like there is a big following, but it's pretty small and elite. It's not very mainstream or public. And it's hard forever, you know, for you to really get into. You definitely, know, like, you have so many younger guys, like, let's say, like, I guess more or less my generation, that, you know, are competitive gamers just by nature. And that's, you know, something about being grown up in this part of this, this time zone. It is, and it's 40K is harder to get into that because it's, the community is pretty small, not as small, but more, much more, like, it's very closed. It's not as open. And this is one thing that we're going to do is help open it up and make it where it's more normalized. So I, um, I think, I think I, I'm going to interject here a little bit. I think that a, a big portion of that is <clears throat> it comes down to player interaction with one another, right? Like anybody mm-hmm. can pick up Fortnite and play Fortnite, right? And like yep. you can get some kills, but if, if, like you play it, you play it for we'll say six hours. You generally understand how to do it and what what to do or whatever i hate fortnite with all my heart every passion (laughs) in my fiery bones however i picked that game because all the children in the universe play it now in comparison to 40k the community itself i'm not going to say that they drive away people but like on if you go on friday night and you go play with those guys like a gigabyte store if you go up there on friday night and you go up there and play like you'll have a pretty good time and you'll you'll generally they're very helpful and stuff you manage to get up there on a Tuesday night, those dudes are just going to run you into the ground. I mean, they're going to be helpful, but you're going to, like, lose games over and over again. And that's, like, super duper, unless you have, like, this stalwart kind of, like, uh, climbing the mountain kind of spirit, like, you're not going to, it's not going to be fun for you. And the, and there's nobody to, like, there's not a lot of people that really hold your hand and, like, kind of you have there's a lot of self-driven motivation to be able to be good at 40k i think more than like to, because there aren't very many tutorials there you know what i mean like and if there are a tutorial a lot of times you got to subscribe to it or pay money to it like yep. and so it's just like and then the hobby itself is so expensive in comparison to other things so like yeah it's it's pretty daunting right there's a there's a high learning curve i mean the basics of the game there's a lot of rules it's complexity but once you kind of get the basics down You've only just dipped into the water. For it. Yeah, I mean, you, you haven't learned about all the other armies. You know, getting good at the game and playing in tournaments is pretty, pretty daunting. And just you know, trying to wrap it all together in the package, painting models, collecting, figuring out lists. 
BCP, yep. I, you know, ITC, you know, what, what are all those things? I, I could see how it could be very intimidating. Mm -hmm. I mean, painting is a whole other aspect, right? Like, let's say you want to play the game, but you don't know anything about painting, and you look at other people's armors, and they look awesome, and yours looks like you dipped it in two coats of paint. Like, that's embarrassing. Like, honestly, unless you just have no have no soul or shame or whatever. But, yeah. Whoa! Hey. I'm ready for my, like, I need to go win another tournament if I can hear y'all's new names for me. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was your first tournament, Brad? I played you in that tournament. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Understand that because my first game of 40k ever was actually in a tournament. I literally like didn't have anyone to play with. My mom took me over there to a shop on the coast, and we went, and that's how I learned. I went one one and one that day. <laughs> um, and you know that was something that again going with what you're saying. You have to have that certain type of drive. You have to have that want to become a better 40k player. Just be, you know, being. You have to have that, I had that myself want, but also awareness of like I'm bad. I gotta get better. <laughs> well, I had myself muted to the to the chat, so my bad. I, Val, I'll give you a shout out first of all, and then we were just talking about uh, my first my first game. So Obey Alliance. Um, everybody's kind of talking about that in chat right now. So I'm assuming they can hear me now. Hopefully they can hear me now. Um, so yeah, they can hear me. Sweet. So Obey Alliance is an esports organization. Um, they. I guess their their main game and team that they have is in the smite scene and that's where you know i i know them from and how we got them kind of connected with mark um, but then they do a lot with uh, streamers and content creators and things like that as well um so they're an esports organization they're cut the first ones to you know take that that stab into the tabletop leap of faith. yeah so uh we've been we've been we've had lots of good conversations with them uh you know mark and richard are obviously two really solid players uh and I guess personalities even right for them to get involved with so we're really looking up uh what they're going to start creating and how they're going to help each other out and help the scene grow as a whole this is the plan yeah it's exciting so we're looking forward to what you put down mark and so if you start doing commentary we'd love to have you on it and, and do that with us so Got a little I'm, I'm excited but nervous so here's something interesting, Mark, because you might not even know this exists, and this is something that could be really cool for you guys as well. So, because I'm I'm a hundred percent doing this, like we're going to be streaming this all the time. So, I don't know. Have you ever played Shadespire? Have you played that or dabbled into that at all? Uh, no, I have not. I just didn't have the don't have the community down here for it. So, there's a digital version for PC hmm. on Steam that is getting made right now. It's in closed beta, and it's supposed to be coming out later this year into like uh, open beta or alpha. And um, so that's going to be a crazy game for like the first like actual like one to one like Warhammer game where yeah. it's exact and you're going to be able to, you know, dabble into that as a streamer and possibly esports and stuff like that. So I think that's like the first step to taking a one to one Warhammer game and seeing it come to life is that game. And it's going to be freaking awesome, in my opinion. Yeah, that'll be really cool. Um. Was well, it something ever seen that got a lot of momentum behind it and you got a good community behind it is mostly what is the uh, uh, tabletop simulators? 
and like hearing some of them do some of their math hammer stuff is just kind of crazy because i don't play the game by particularly math but i know a couple people like they're doing it for like they're teaching and they're showing other people and that's how like i think glass hammer is doing some of their coaching is playing tabletop simulator with other people across you know, the world that are getting their coaching services and just teaching them little basics teaching them some of these these little redundant things that need to be taught you know that's kind of like okay cool well if i want to do this i have to set up a table i have to do all these extra steps where you can do it on the, where you can do it on the computer and just learn how to deploy have not to screw yourself up and just setting up models and stuff like that that'll be kind of something that would be a good idea to show hmm yeah, it's Sorry, just I'm like just, you, you yeah, got you gotta just like mod the you gotta mod the game. So it's like it's not yeah. user friendly. Like it takes so long to like get used to and set up and stuff like that. So I think that that's where the the turn away and the downfall is with like the tabletop simulator. Like I tried to do it a little bit and I was like, yeah, this takes way too long to go and like find all the add ons and mod it and find all the models and stuff like that. And it's just like, nah, this takes too long. Screw that. I have no idea. I've just thought about that just a moment. I was like, that would be a good way to show examples. Maybe? Nope. <laughs> I mean, no, no, it would, it would be, but it's like what Brad said. It's just, it's, it's a lot of setup. I mean, you could just, by the time you do all that, just go to the table and have a camera. Well, yeah, exactly. What's up, ATL awesome. Lupo, our, uh, our hey, FLG Lupo. Matt winner from uh, last week. Thomas, you missed that. We did a giveaway McKin last week on stream. McKinsey. Oh, wow. I heard, I heard you guys hit mm -hmm. over 50. Yeah, yeah we got over 50, man. It was huge. And ATL Lupo pulled it in hard. So, yeah. What's up, McKinsey? How you doing, bud? So uh, speaking of giveaways, let's touch on this real quick. So the Army Painter, uh, the most recent sponsor that you know we've really solidified and everything. They're going to be doing a lot of prizing for the Atlanta Open event. Um, like so much prizing, I don't even remember it off the top of my head. But it's like it's painting competitions. There's stuff for the winners of each bracket for those other like 13 brackets that are going on. Um, and then there's additional prizing for some other stuff as well. But then every single week leading up to the event, They've supplied us with a giveaway. So starting tomorrow, we're going to have a giveaway for the Army Painter. And then every week after that until the event, there's going to be a giveaway of product from the Army Painter. And then on top of that, there's one bigger giveaway. So we're going to have people entering through the next like six weeks. And then the week before, November 25th, uh, that Monday, we're going to announce a winner. And that winner is going to get over $150 worth of... Uh, merchandise from the army painter and they're going to basically say here's the army that they are going to be playing at the atlanta open and they're going to supply you with like all the paints and everything that you would need for your army essentially so sick so if you have any last minute grinding like we all do before a tournament you can get hooked up for it sweet 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 i like the i i, I don't know that sounds really just awesome <laughs> Yeah, I've lot. recently been dabbling in the army painter stuff recently because like I got some from ATC and I'm sitting there like I am loving every single bit of this. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> I need to open a raffle. What? <laughs> yeah, army painter makes some good stuff. But they have some really good color primer. Uh, if you still use the rattle cans, they're great. They you don't have to prime and then do another color. You're straight into your base color. You do their quick shades. If you're really on a crunch, you can really kind of do. And and I think they have their own kind of. A GW style like contrast paint that they have so I don't know sure exactly all the lines that they have but uh, uh, they definitely make a quality product did you guys see the new painting stuff that uh, GW released today no no what, what uh, did they put out? a red paint handle a pack of five paint handles a little uh, it's like a rubber thing that sits on your desk and you put three pot uh, paint paint pots in it so you don't tip them over and spill them everywhere so they got oh, that man. And then the coolest part my... is it's like this like plastic sheet and it's got rubber bands on it that like hook on and then it rubber bands hold your guys to it and it's got a little handle for you to put like probably 10 or 15 guys on to be able to spray them and prime them. So now you're holding this handle with rubber bands like holding your guys on it and uh, you can spray them instead of, you know, using uh, any type of like, you know, tack or anything like that for like fully... Well, I'll tell you what I stuff. do. I put it on the lid container to the dog food. <laughs> yes, that is exactly yeah, what, what I, I do what too. I, that's what I've used for years. <laughs> it's uh, it's got like all these different colors on it, and I'm pretty sure I've killed my dogs on the way out because I've been spray painting oh, the no. top of there. 
No, I'm just kidding. Gosh, dang it. We're on the what internet. Was... Watch what you say. Jeez. What? <laughs> what? what? What is this? Baby? Is it showing it on their website? I don't see any of this. Yeah, it's on their uh, like their community release, like today. Hmm. It was like a bunch of. Uh, it was like there's like new terrain for Sigmar, and then the whole like uh, new Sigmar. Uh, I don't know, bone guys that are like Egyptian, and then uh, yeah. it's got the paint stuff. Oh, here it is. I I see it. So I'm definitely picking up one of those spray handle things because those are those are awesome and gonna be super helpful. And those, okay. those, those, those bone guys. I'm not an Age of Sigmar guy, but those bone guys look sweet. I know. It's like I wish. I, I wish there was more birds. stuff to convert. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'd, I'd play Age of Sigmar if more people played it. Right. I've done a little bit like delving into. It. I'm like, this is cool. I have demons, so it's just like, okay, I'll go play like this little bit of things. But like, the community is so much like in the, in the places like some places like they're just uh, words. Uh, it's like it's there. And then, like, you come back next month, and there's no one there. I'm just like, oh, never mind. I think they get abducted by aliens, because it's too weird. <laughs> Our GW just allows them to come out and play every once in a while. <laughs> All right, so let's 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 tune the turn towards our event a little bit, and let's talk about what's going on with the Atlanta Open, and just to talk about, like, the let's rules and rules codex first. and stuff let's like that. Let's talk about rules cut off. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you want to talk about rules cut off? So lists are due next week, right? Yeah, November 1st. November 1st. That's Friday, I believe, right? So those folks that are listening in, yeah, haven't haven't thought about your list or even think you think about putting it in. It's a it's a month out, so you got to have your list ready to and turn in. And check your damn emails because I'm missing like 40 people's shirt sizes still, and you about <laughs> to not get a shirt. <laughs> get your shirts. Get your stuff. Don't do yeah. that. You got to get your stuff. I got to get the so, shirts yeah. placed. I need the shirt sizes. So uh, I know that I've been hit up quite a bit on on Facebook, Messenger, personal text about the cutoff uh, for lists and rules. So one of the big things that uh, really kind of caught people's eye is, you know, we just had the Iron Hands drop. Of course, the big controversial uh, and much needed probably fact for them that kind of really changed the power of, of what they were doing out in the tournament scene. And yep. then right on the hot of the heels of that, they had the new Eldar and then Salamanders and, and Imperial Fist. So um, when we went to put out the cutoff for Pro Tabletop, we really had to kind of pick a line in the sand and say, hey, we're not quite sure when they're going to drop back. We're not quite sure when all these new Marine books are coming out. But we need to put a line in here that says, after this date, no more new rules. Because we know with new rules becomes new facts, new power levels, new changes, and people have to kind of get their armies ready. And with an event that what we're doing, we're putting money on the line, we want to make sure we have everything buttoned up. We got all the rules that are in place so the judges are going to be you know, actively judging. They need to know uh, the rules. So you can't have new rules drop in a week before the event, having them you know, judge them and actually know them. Uh, you know, we don't want any controversy there. So it's kind of like, what's that date going to be? So we kind of picked that line in, in the sand. Uh, it just happened to fall uh, right before the new Eldar stuff. So you know, we had no idea that was coming out. And it also yeah. cuts off Hero Fist and Salamander. So the, the latest, you know, the last thing update into the event is uh, Iron Hands with the new fact drop. So um, I know one of the things, and I'll let other guys open up for comments, but one of the things that really kind of, caught people's eyes is like hey it's a month out six weeks out how, how come i can't use the new eldar how come i can't use iron hand or you know pearl fist salamanders you know, yeah. if, if you think about you think about iron hands like when they first came out like day one even in the commentary when they released the fact they already knew that there was issues with that book playtesters already yep. said hey this book is super strong people were telling them hey this is strong but they wanted to see, and they waited, and they waited before they finally issued that fact. And I think they actually put the fact out pretty quickly, but it took a yeah. couple of weeks, right? Before yeah, it probably about two, two weeks. Two and a half. It, it came out like three weeks and some change, but compared to like their other like FAQs that they do join, it's like two weeks directly after the book release. Yeah. It was actually kind of slow, uh, and we yeah. all get a little nervous. Like we were sitting all sitting there, and we're like, Yeah, they're not going to be... change it. It's not going to change. It's going to be this way for the next yeah. six months. Yeah. So if you, if you just think about it in that context, right? So I just dropped some new rules today. 
a month out from the event, you know, when, when, because like Salamanders and Iron and Hero Fists, right? They just they just came out this weekend, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. If if you're like, oh, I want those rules to be good. I want them to be used in the event. Well, it could be two or three weeks before fact drops comes out. If they come out super powerful, a fact drops, you know, one week before the event. Now everyone's scrambling. Do we allow that fact in? Do we, you know, do we allow those rules in? I mean, it really could cause a lot of turmoil. We don't want that in the in the first event, especially yeah. with everything else going on. That scrutiny. We want to make sure this event's tightened up, yep. buttoned up. Yeah, because like, I think you... that could also say go, go, compare this to like the other professional like video game stuff. Like they don't even allow updates to the game from big competitions a few weeks out. Like it's like what a month. Uh, sometimes that. beforehand it usually what happens is it's yeah it's like the, it can change the game state so much that these little micro changes can just change your entire game plan like it just yeah. it will nullify it or make this a little over the top or so forth and it just messes up with your prep yeah there's a lot of prep going into it i mean you should be practicing you should have some stuff thrown together you know last minute it's, it's going to be the people that are trying to win this thing they're going to be putting in the time. They're going to have the terrain set up. They're going to be running through it. So, you know, exactly. spending weeks and months tuning your list all of a sudden to have something drop in at the last minute that can uh, upset all that, <clears throat> it's, it's really, you know, causes some unbalance there. So we made the made the decision to, to set the line. It just I happened think, to hit after the fact. And, you know, that's we've got a lot of comments about that. But that's yeah. what we are. I think another thing that kind of goes hand in hand with that is from – and this is more of a selfish reason why not to, but you know, if they, let's say they, they, they come out with this stuff that, you know, whatever, like everybody gets all their models, whatever, let's say we allowed it, right? Then <clears throat> everybody, but we have to push the list date now back, you know, like it goes to like the middle of November or whatever, when you submit your list. Well then let's say that they drop, they drop an FAQ two weeks after that but we said we'll, we'll already have said all right well let's go ahead and allow the faq too you know in case it needs to be balanced body yada yada well on the selfish side from pro tabletop now we're like a week out from our event right and people are have submitted these lists and we're like okay well now we have to like learn all of these new faq rules and which one of these lists have now become invalidated or illegal, and that has to change. And it just creates this whole ripple effect of problems. Well, now these people have to go back and change their lists. Well, now it's unfair because they get to go and change their lists. And All the you other know, people are stuck with the decisions that they made to counter yeah, that that no longer exactly, exist. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah. Yeah, I, mean I, I get the – I want to use the new Shining, especially if that's my you know, army of – I've been playing for 100 years, and now they're good again. Um, but it, it, you have to really think about – how that affects the whole game and the event and you know like if your if your plan was i'm going to use the new rules that i haven't seen yet you know and now you're upset because those new rules came out but you're not allowed i mean i i, I can't really you know, get on your side because you know you're planning for something that you haven't even seen and you're you're upset you can't use it right now because i mean i mean the game is still is still valid we still know what armies do um i mean you, you got You'll be able to use it in the next tournament. So, I mean, yeah, there's so many things happening on. It's not like you're gonna get not play with your toys. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, and somebody in chat said, you know, the the rules is fine, but the the list submission being so far out might be a little bit more of a hindrance. So, if we touch on that a little bit, what are your guys' thoughts on on that and why we're doing it like that? And for for me personally, for this first event, the reason that I wanted it early is so that all of us and all of our refs have enough time to thoroughly check everything because yep. you know we're being very very careful with with this event um yep. and releasing them to the public we haven't said when we're going to release them to the public to check or make them notable um so you know if the players think that hey players shouldn't have access to those lists until a week out then cool if they think that hey we should have access three weeks out then cool you know i think we're open to to that discussion but for this first event it's something where you know, we're just being very, very extra cautious and we want to check all of our boxes as best as we can because we know there's going to be a lot of scrutiny for any mistakes that happen. So we just want to minimize any potential issues and starting with lists is number one. Yeah. Oh, no, no. God. <laughs> I was like, well, because I'm in the right in the middle and I'm not playing Warzone this year. So we're, we're getting all those lists because list cutoffs were last week for Warzone and we're getting all the people submitting lists and 
I mean, eighth edition in general is, you know, a little bit more complex when it comes to building your list and clicking on things. But I could tell you, it's unbelievable the amount of lists that come in that are not built correct, that don't right. have the attachment set up right, that don't have their warlord submitted, that don't have, you know, this, that, or the other. And, you know, and a little easier this year submitting because y'all don't require the psychic spells to be marked yeah, down anymore. It, exactly. That was a huge problem last year was people didn't have their spells put down on the stupid psychers. I know. Even when we went to ATC, like people didn't have their factions for their their different, you know. Mm -mm. It's So like if you just think about it, hey, I turned in my list. Hey, there's an error with my list. Uh, unintentional. We contact you. Hey, you know, you need to fix your list. Like there's some back and forth in time. Otherwise, you're giving people penalties. Like, you know, if you don't do that a little bit early, you know, you never want to get in a situation where someone won, but you somehow missed an error in their list, and now you know they have a, a illegal list, and now what do you have to do? You know, mid tournament or you know post tournament, right? So you yeah. want to have plenty of time to have a lot of eyes on it, both internally and you know from the internet's perspective when we launch it, so everyone can review those lists and start talking and see really what we want. So we want to have plenty of time for that. I know. Uh, you know, list due in November, right, December, you know, tournament, it seems kind of stark, but I mean, just based on what I saw for Warzone, people don't even know how to use BCP and right. turn in lists. It's like, you would be surprised on the names. I'm not going to say those names. But <laughs> some of the people who are high tier tournament players who are saying, hey, I don't know how to use this. Well, and it goes one step further for us because we're broadcasting and we're integrating so much into the broadcast. When I send out the email right. of how people have to submit their lists, uh, they have to submit it two ways. So like you have to go into BCP and you need to do a plain form like text format. And I even I even did a full step by step yeah, written out instructions yeah. with photos on how to do it for that. And for the second version of giving me the raw roster file so that we could load the roster file into our broadcast software and pull all of the stats and all the lists automatically so we don't have to do any of that manually. So to, to hound the players to get two different list submissions so that we're able to make our broadcast good because that's one of our main focuses and also so that everything is submitted in the you know simple text format so people can review it really fast. So it's not only one format, it's two. And you know one is on BCP and one is an email and it's checking it and making sure it's good. Um, you know, and then the next thing that comes out of that is what is, what is the punishment going to be if you don't submit your list? Like if a list is not submitted on November 1st, what is the punishment every single day or every single week that that is not submitted? Um, for me immediately, it's going to start off with a very strict punishment and it's going to just get stricter and stricter. So I think that, you know, 48 hours out of list being submitted, we're going to set, send those exact rules out of what those punishments are going to be. So everybody knows that's in the tournament. Um, but I mean, it might start off with a yellow card. I mean, it might start off with some disadvantaging games. Like we got to take this serious because every time lists aren't submitted, then that's giving every, that player has a day, two days, a week, two weeks longer to think about what they're going to submit. And that's not fair. So every single minute that your list is not in on time, the punishment is going to get worse and worse and worse. I mean, so, maybe, maybe we'll make it so that you're like the uh, the year the uh, you will automatically be the lower seed or something the first round or whatever you know. Or... I see that be getting worse. If you listen to uh, the recent, um, not recent, like a couple weeks ago when uh, Navadi had on our war with Stephen Box on, and they you know Navadi talked about having some he knew some people that purposely took the yellow card, therefore they would see the list and come more prepared because they know they're probably there, there is a person they're not going to get any yellow card during the event. Um. I see that, and like I know other people. I saw about doing the same thing. I'm just, I'm like, that's I, that's a bad strategy, and that doesn't, that's not really punishable enough because they're just seeing the rules as a resource, like they talked about on there. And I was thinking, you know, if you have to, if you turn your list in after the list have already been posted publicly, you take a round one loss or take a point decrease in your, in your first round, you know, round one game. You take like a twenty. Or Oh yeah. I, oh, I mean, if somebody's list isn't submitted by the time that we're going to release it publicly, like they're not going to be able to play in the event. They're not going to be able to check in. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that we're planning on, you know, releasing a, the list until every single list is in. So if that ends up going, you know, all the way until the day of the tournament, then that's that, you know, dumbass who didn't put their list in for an entire month. But you know, if that stuff's going to happen, you know, right. We can contact them and hound them and hound them and hound them. But we're going to definitely announce a very strict 
you know, punishment and rule set. And, and sure, a yellow card is not enough punishment. Maybe that's enough punishment if you're a day late, right? Like, oh, you're a day late, no big deal. You got a yellow card. It is what it is. But yeah, if you're if you're if problems. you're a, a week late, like you now have a week advantage, and everybody else to think about your list more and to see how the meta has developed more. Like, it's not fair. It's also that, but also like you know, as soon as those lists go live, you want to be able to look at them and public, you know, put them public as soon as possible. Well, now you're just hindering everyone else's prep because you're off. You know, you're taking a week to upload your list, where the plan was to have it a couple days after all the lists were submitted to have them go public. Yeah, exactly. You're just pushing. You're making everyone else's prep harder. That's right. Yeah, because I mean, once the lists are locked in, everyone will get a chance to see it, and they'll have it a little bit ahead of time, right? So. Yeah. Depending on what that cutoff is, you'll have a few weeks to prepare before the event comes. Everyone will know your list, you'll know everyone else's list, and you'll kind of be walking in uh, with more prep under your belt. Again, we want to make the event where everyone has all the variables kind of as much as they can uh, known ahead of time. You know what the train's going to look like, you know what yep. the lists are that you're facing, and you know you can now just start prepping mentally about how you're going to play your games versus those type of oh. Some of the guys are definitely like you're seeing like out of uh, compare like ETC to kind of how the American style is like we're like we're enjoying having you know we can play with our rules as soon as we get them we want to do this yada yada but if you go to the ETC like their stuff is their lists are to punch you know put public like a month and a half or so or maybe like no less than a month before the event goes live like it, it happens and then also at the same time like uh, they know their round one pairings that, that same time. So that gives up all the extra time for prepping, which, you know, players should be rewarded for all the extra prep time that they put into the game. But all that practice and knowing those lists and knowing having a, hey, look, we have a month before the tournament. All the information we need to know about round one and, you know, the tournament period is right there in front of us. Now we can really start the serious hardcore prep. We know the roster. We know what people are bringing. Yeah, yeah, and, and look yeah. at that as any other sport or esport, like everything, right? If you're in any sport and you're a football team, you know who you're playing your next game, and you can study everything about them, yep. you know, to be able to go up against them. So if you have that for, you know, one out of nine games for our event as a study point, then yeah, why not? And also, getting those lists public allows the public to find any errors that, you know, our staff might have missed. Because let's be real, like we're all humans. There's probably going to be something small that is overseen There's and always missed. So always something yeah. so like like micro that you're just like, oh, I didn't notice that. Or like there's a point saying that's wrong because maybe like the battle scribe roster that they use is not upgraded on this one point thing. Or so forth like that. Yeah. And and if you haven't like been on our, our little Monday night free plays, uh, I mean we're really trying to up the game on the commentary, on the on the broadcasting and the streaming. So anything we can do to build up the hype, build up the the you know the excitement for the event and really prep for that event having that stuff ahead of time uh, you, know, you know talking about the matchups talking about the opponents who's playing uh what the strategy is going to be you know that's all fuel for the fire that we want to do because we really want to see this be something special and something new in yeah our, in our like, like going through every single matchup and lists you know the week before instead of playing a game and us just sitting down and just going through every single thing like that's a really good show just for everybody like to learn about what's going on what everybody's playing all of our predictions for the matches and stuff like that like that's f some fun to do and different yep. and that's that's an interesting point though mark you bring up about them doing the pairings early so you know i don't know if that's something we're you're looking at doing but man, can you imagine if, if you knew first round you're supposed to be playing so and so and having a chance to you know one plan for that and see their list and think about it but then also just have a chance for us as the as the commentators to kind of, you know, comment on how that match is going to go and start talking about it. Well, also think about it this way. If you go know who you're playing around one, you're going to study their list from hell. And then everyone is pretty much checking their opposition's list. You're check your you're list checking for your opponent. Yeah. So if there is an error in the list, it will get found because someone's opponent is going to find it. <laughs> yeah, and if nothing That's else, good. like first game, you're not going to have any questions. You shouldn't about what your opponent's army does, right? If you've done your exactly. homework, like, your first game should go like smoothly, like right? Mm-hmm. What was that? I said your first game will go smoothly. You should have no questions about what their list does and how it works. And, uh, you know, we, we want to have a smooth event, especially the first round, you know, about that. Exactly. 
And I think the Nova Open does that too. They like they post up like a week or two beforehand, or maybe even longer. You know, round one pairings for the Invitational. Which all this like it's we have numbers behind it. There's not a lot that shows that this is successful, but it's has worked under some places. And I think that type of stuff would be cool. Yeah, I mean, anybody in the chat have any thoughts on that? That's an interesting thought. I never thought about that before. Yeah, let's see. Uh, you know, what it, what does chat think, and what does everybody out there think? Do you do you release you know the round one pairings or not? I I personally I, I it's kind of cool. I like it. I'm not I'm not opposed to it. Like if I was a player, I think that would be cool. Um, I wouldn't mind yep. it, but I'm not playing in this one, so it's not up to me. Another <laughs> idea that would be interesting is we all get bracketed before the tournament starts and then day one is you playing in your bracket of set eight and you know you have to beat possibly day one that would add a really new that would add a really interesting uh mechanic to it because that says hey look here's eight players i need to either again like i said earlier check their list make sure they're good and, you know study them it'll emphasize and also just benefit more players for um just putting more time into the game becoming more of a student of the game so forth yeah i don't think that really applies in our our format just yeah i think that would be altering the whole format yeah but it yeah, does yeah, it that, is interesting for sure mm -hmm. that may be something that look into the future that's what i was kind of thinking about idea wise because like that would be that would be that would be really interesting as everyone kind of had a random grouping all right, so I'm putting, I'm putting something on screen that nobody's seen yet, except people that are attending that I sent an email with, if they check the email. So I mean, I've got, sure. I've got the ring, I've got the ring up on screen. So if you haven't seen okay. the ring, the ring's up on screen. So Who's anybody up? in chat, I just threw this in here really quick. Uh, so this oh, is. Oh, is it legit? Is this happening? Oh, it's happening. Oh, it's not like full screen, full screen, and it's bothering me. I gotta see if I can make this bigger while I'm live. We'll do it. We'll do it. There we go. Now it's taking up the whole thing. So yeah, so the idea is that uh, the winner so, yeah, is getting so this. Uh, oh, mute, mute your stream! I hear myself. Uh, so yeah, uh, Baron Rings—they do the rings for like everything and anything. Um, so this is kind of what it would be. The idea uh, would be obviously the player's name, and then where the dice is, uh, we'd like to put the the faction icon of whatever faction they're playing there. So the dice would get replaced with the faction icon um, Ooh, of whoever wins. That's super sweet. I want to play now so I can get my ring. So they're gonna have like really, they're gonna have like some really cool like you... 3D renders and videos and stuff for us to promote this, and then the actual ring will get made after the tournament once we know the where, players info where, and stuff. Where would you wear that ring to? Would you wear it all the time, Thomas? Oh yeah, to my executive meetings. I'm like, ooh, bling. Where every tournament? Yeah, every tournament the... you go to, you're gonna be wearing that, bro. You're gonna be like <laughs> intimidation 101. You just like you're like ugh. Like shake your hand, you're like, oh yeah, bro fist in it, you know, the ring's just prominent. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that thing, that's a, it's a, a serious business right there. Yep, so, I mean, it's it's part of what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to take this to the next level, we're trying to do as much prize support as possible, we're trying to have as many people involved and just make people feel like they are athletes and getting professional, so like, you know, this is instead of a trophy, like, why go out and get a trophy when we can just do something different? Than what everyone else is doing but it's yeah. at the same time super cool yeah <laughs> and, and then if you want to put it in a trophy case like or on a stand like you can do it man it's, it's or make a awesome. necklace out of it yeah i think some people are posting that in the, in yeah. the chat yeah yep. mm. making necklace. So yeah that's that's that i think i'd get mine my necklace would be gold and it would have like big I'd, I'd just make it thug as possible. <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> just to represent my yeah, Mr. T in it. Person. You got the gold yeah. tooth. And... Yeah, I'd get a. I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd get a. I'd I get a gold tooth. Big, big energy. What? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Oops. I didn't. What did he say? I don't know what he said. I wasn't what? listening. So I had a couple people asking me if ticket sales were done. Like. The ticket sales are closed, right? So we're, yeah, we're ticket in. ticket sales are closed. Um, if there is anybody who's like super last minute that wants to, you know, hit us up on Facebook or, you know, email us, and in the next like forty eight hours, we could squeeze in like one or two more people, um, just because there are some people that, 
either aren't able to go that did buy tickets and it's an odd number or, you know, it's a buffer for other people that might have stuff come up between now and then. Um, but the big, the big reason for closing the sales is so that we can get all the information out there to everybody on how to submit the lists and how everything is going to work. So we don't want, you know, somebody buying a ticket the day before list submissions and then not submitting their list because they go, Oh, well, I didn't know how to do it. Well, we've sent out three detailed emails on everything so far with step-by-step -step instructions. So if you're not, you know, getting those emails or something, then you should probably hit us up and find out why you're not getting them. Yeah. And it's a, it's also like a logistics thing, right? So getting all the terrain and getting all the tables prepped and, yes. and ordered all the stuff, there's some lead time associated with that. So yeah. we kind of had to lock that down. Yeah. Like I got, sure. I got, you know, 57 tables of terrain that are built and 90% painted right now. So it's like, if we had 20 more people sign up next Friday, well, now my entire schedule gets thrown off of ordering that, getting it produced and painted and, and done up, you know, renting the tables, renting the chairs, the layout of the venue, all of that. I, I, uh, I have, I have a little thought, um, not to backtrack too much, but being able to have the list submitted and having them available sooner, like your actual pairings, your first round pairings. You know, what would be interesting about that is if somebody gets paired up against a Mark Perry, we'll say, and Mark? and they're uh, the, they're uh, a Scrubble Bumpkins in, as far as the game is concerned. But if they have up. enough time, if they have enough time to plan and they beat Mark, like that gives these like lower level players on round one to be able to knock out a top tier player potentially right like because just because of planning and preparing and if they wanted and to it, that's an excellent point too because like that's honestly what a lot of people on the would you say on the lower tier you know like they're good players they're confident players but what they lack sometimes is just that you know, planning being put in that position right. before the game even starts and they really think about what they need to do yeah I so, agree. so I think the only downfall in my opinion, and somebody posted in chat as well is like, if you do release the round one pairings and then what if somebody doesn't show up and then it just jacks up all of the pairings? Like if it's multiple people that don't show up and now you have to move pairings around and now it's just like, oh, well those couple people are oh, now to a that. complete yeah. disadvantage yeah. because they're the only ones you can't study. So then you either have to you know, if it's one person, it's not a big deal, right? Because you can throw a ringer in there and it's just like, hey, it's whatever. But if it's, but yeah, otherwise you got to go into buys and then, you know, how do you adjust points for buys? Do they get the max? Do they get the round average? How does that work? So it's like, how do you adjust that? Because, right, it's not fair for that one person or two people to then be like, hey, I have to play somebody that I didn't have any time to study, but everybody else had time to study it. Right. Um, and then if you randomize the whole bracket on the day one, everyone's going to just lose their mind at you. Yeah, because I just spent three weeks studying this other list, and now I'm not even playing it. Yeah, that'd be upset. Yeah, that's that's true valid points. I guess it's, that's something more, I guess, maybe for an invitational level or as the game gets bigger. Yeah. Because we all kind of get adjusted to it. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think, I think there, there could be a situation where, like, you can do that, and if you don't have a match, and this could be something just for all tournaments in general, because right now you throw a ringer in there where somebody, you know, fills in and plays. Well, <laughs> it's like, hey, that's a feel good because I get to play a game. But if you have an odd or even number of people that are dropping out, and you just need to be like, hey, here you could play a game, but this game doesn't go towards anything. But you could either play or not play if you want to sit here for three hours and do nothing. Um, but you know, then there has to be a median of like the how do the battle points work is it is it an average of you is it an average of the tournament what is it just a max like how does that equal out and i think then that also goes towards you know the formats being skewed more to win loss only which we're very partial to win loss only and the battle points are you know a secondary thing to where win loss is our primary but so like it's like hey you get a win because you're the person you're supposed to play isn't here but then when it comes down to battle points for a tie or for anything else like that or advancing into a bracket, how do you how do you determine how many battle points that person should have got for that game that didn't happen? Right. There, yeah, there's, there's probably a way and solution and stuff to do it. But right now, I don't think the scene is developed enough to implement that right away. Sure. No, we haven't hit that stage yet. Oh, yeah. Now I was all excited about it, and now you know all these counterpoints are. Like, 
but but that's the thing is like right that that's a good goal to have so if we say hey look these are this is something that everybody would love to have it would be awesome content would be this that and the other then it's it's awesome and it's like okay how do we build towards that well we need to put these five things into place to build towards it so let's try to do that for the next tournament yep and then, yeah so i think one of the thing where when we get to that stage where everyone's kind of on that mutual level and the community has grown so much on the whole where they can you know where it was like okay cool well we've gotten to the prepping stage well we kind of prep for everyone in the tournament now we don't feel too bad about our round one changing because we've had more time to just get better at the game the community as a whole has gotten stronger yeah and i think i think honestly a lot that could also play into that as well as like the standardized mats and tables and terrain and stuff like that and like simple simplified rule sets with less variables i think all that helps with with that where it's like oh Right. If you have a if you have a terrain in the the terrain or a table and the terrain is random, right? And I know I'm playing against Mark and I know his list is this way, I could go, all right, here's the deployment I really want. Here's how I could deploy and set up, you know, against him. Uh or I guess if it's our terrain, right, and it's standardized. But then if it's random terrain, you get planted bowling ball it, and you're you're not gonna you're not gonna have any idea how to how to go up against that. So like it's it's a lot harder than and it's it's a lot more I guess meaningless to know your i not like i i guess that's not the right word but it's not as impactful knowing your pairings if you don't know the terrain because if you yeah, know prepare, if you know you the terrain your exactly exactly that's the thing yeah. which i think yeah. arguably is one of the most important parts of the game going into that terrain part also goes in that same thing but i really like y'all's draft appointment zones because that makes so many more matchups uh not so skewed because sometimes like you go into this matchup and you're like I win like five out of six games here on the day, all the different deployment zones, except for this one deployment zone, but I'm just absolutely just screwed on. And then you roll that one deployment zone and you're just screwed. Hey man, I played I hammer and anvil, it. you know, every single round at ATC and I wanted to die afterwards. I was just like, I can't get a <laughs> deployment zone that I can actually, I was like, I could play any deployment zone, but hammer and anvil. Can I stop getting hammer and anvil? Right. Well, I think that also, that's just so nice because it, that, that takes away that whole random terrain part too that makes it so bad is having that type of idea that you know, deployment zones, you can mitigate that. Right. Yeah. And those yeah. places that don't have, you know, we can't standardize all the terrain because either our, you know, our our area doesn't have that type of funds or we just had the stockpile and built up for years. Yeah. You know, so, we can easily just add that in. That makes it a lot easier. So there's one more thing I want to touch on for like the last five minutes or so that we got here. So, um, going forward with competitive, you know, 40 K and Warhammer and everything like that, and how it becomes more mainstream, easier to learn and stuff. I saw a pretty big discussion on, um, you know, the secondaries of ITC and how hard it is to teach people and learn and adapt and stuff like that. And it's something that I think is a very valid point and it's something that should be addressed and talked about openly and a solution should be found for it. So my, my question is. Going forward, and Mark, because you're very familiar with esports and how, and you know, you follow, you understand it. Like, you know, if you go and watch any game esports and they're playing Capture the Flag, you immediately know what's happening. If they play yep. Team Deathmatch, you immediately know what's happening, right? You go to Warhammer and you have no idea what is happening. Even if you yep. are a player and you don't see those secondaries on screen, you have no idea what's happening. You don't know what they're trying to accomplish. You don't know what they're playing for, anything like that. So You don't know the tempo that those, each of those players are trying to play under. Right. So so how can secondaries, I guess, should they be, first of all, adjusted, removed, and the, all the missions revamped in a way to make it easier to play, easier to set up, easier to adapt, easier to watch, everything like that so that it's more mainstream rather than having... 25 you know odd variables of picking stuff or do you need to have the element of being able to pick some mission type for different armies or does it not matter because if you say hey here's the missions here's the deployment permission it's all set out in front of you you know that you're gonna have to build a list for those five missions what's better what's worse right so really to me the secondaries are a great choice like they are, they need to stay in the game in some other way. If you get rid of them, you know, we, we won't have to change like the missions as a whole. But choosing your secondaries allows you to, there's a game inside the game. And most every single type of like tabletop, card game, video games, there's always a game that you're playing 
on the side between you and your opponent. You're trying to figure out him out. You're trying to figure out what he's going to do. You know, what's his quirks? What's his strategy? Like, is he trying to gimmick on you or is he just, he's just a raw player on his own. And it goes into that strategy of sometimes, you know, there's this idea that, you know, you can choose a secondary that's okay for you, but you can bait it to make it your opponent feel like he has to play a certain way. Like sometimes choosing re like choosing recon is a game, you know, winning stage right there. Like that's a step that you can choose recon and you can win or lose by choosing recon. Because sometimes you just don't understand that, hey, look, I'm getting shut out. I can't control the board. My opponent is just controlling the board. Recon cannot, you know, is no good. But I chose it and it screwed me up. Um, I think the thing is, is the amount of information that people understand that these are these extra little, like little extra things where your opponent will look at your secondaries and understand how you're playing more than you will play. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a common thing. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it certainly affects how you play and how the opponent plays. But I think just from a, a, a outside person kind of watching the game to make it more mainstream, if you have the secondaries, you have to have a way to a mechanism to kind of show that or re reinforce that right. these are the things so that the you know your audience knows, right? So you want to really kind of keep them up to date in the loop so they can follow yep. along even if they're not watching kind of the whole thing all yeah. at once. So that's I take the comedy have to understand when they can look at the game state and they need you know they need full on knowledge understand that hey look they're going into them like talk to the community i'm like they choose this second they did choose this they choose x they chose y well clearly that tells us two things that this player wants it to play that way this player wants to play that way so anytime those players are not being are being forced not to play those ways you know that's that's the calling sign that's part of like where you know having good combinators really comes into it I mean, now, if we're just having people that we're not going to have commentators and we just need people to be able to watch the game, well, I think that's still a little like, I don't, I personally don't like that. Like, I have problems watching overhead games uh, just on anything if it doesn't have something like commentating or people just talking because, like, it can get a little tedious and a little bit at times boring. And if you look, look away for five minutes and come back, you, the game, the game state could have took a 180 and you don't know what's happening anymore. So I, I think I think you're right, Mark, but I also think you're coming from your perspective, right? Right where you understand forty K. I think Brad's question is more directed towards people like, you know, your Joe Schmo that has no idea about forty K, but you know But not even people that don't know anything about forty K. It's the casual audience turning them competitive, allowing them to go to more events, whether sure. they're a expert skilled player or not, but it's just the pure understanding Sure. of all the additional stuff and you know is that too much for pete like are all these rules and stuff like that for stuff is it just too much to comprehend and everything um just in, i think just probably, in general i think probably for your general people yeah i think it is very i think if you have somebody that just plays on friday nights at gigabytes <clears throat> and then you're like okay here's all these itc secondaries they don't they're like well where is the where is the uh, Maelstrom mission? You know what I mean? Like, there's no, what's the eternal war? What, you, know, you know what I mean? So like, I think there should be at some point, some type of wording or vernacular that we utilize in order to be able to make it so that, you know, this is King of the Hill. This is capture the flag, basically. Blah, right. blah. And so we can say that over and over again as we're doing our commentations and stuff. And people are like, oh, okay, yeah everybody like you said knows what capture the hill everybody knows what team deathmatch is right so like you, yeah. you say those kinds of things like it would be super easy and and there will be i think there could be secondaries that like okay this is you know kill team or, or excuse me this is team deathmatch but you know then he also has to secure this cargo container what it doesn't matter I'm, I'm just throwing stuff out there but like i think there is a way where we could easily do that in the future where it's like and i think you're exactly right brad i think having that kind of thing to make it so it is for lack of a better term here more sexy and appealing to to everyone to watch and less of a less of like i have to like really concentrate on this to understand what's going on right like because people that are watching streams they're not trying to concentrate normally do you know what i mean that's not that's not like you're not trying to go watch some sort of uh this isn't like watching a super complicated movie. You know, you're watching a game and you want to be entertained. And that's the bottom, absolute bare baseline of all this. You want to be entertained. Yeah, and 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 let's let's look at it as a, 
a sport, for example, right? Because you could do, you could you could use this comparison for baseball, hockey, soccer, football, everything. If if a general person is tuning in, they know that the goal of the game is to score in one in whatever way that sports deem of a scoring is, right? A touchdown, a field goal, a soccer goal, a hockey goal, you know, a run, whatever it is. So it's like, okay, if you know your basic of scoring is X, Y, and Z, and then all the other rules that come into play for it are irrelevant, um, that's, that's one thing. But when the scoring mechanic is one of those complicated rules, it makes it that much harder then to comprehend the game as a whole. Right? Like, well, like if scoring a touchdown wasn't just getting across the line, if it had to touch five people's hands and you had to kick it once and then get it across the line, is anybody going to know that that ever exists I, and how I, it happens? That's why rugby is not as popular as it, as it could be because it's a very good <laughs> game. Well, I see that's the problem is like we play an already pretty complicated game. And that's one of the reasons I do like how the ITC stuff is. is you know, at times I actually I'm kind of getting bored over cross with like ITC missions just because like, they play ITC wise. They don't exactly play like super like 40k wise. Sometimes they don't feel like 40k. Sometimes yes. they feel like we're playing ITC. And I kind of like I, that's why I enjoy doing Warzone or some of the other different missions. Is like it adds an extra flair. And sometimes it you know keeps me on track. But and that's like it just feels more aesthetic. And that's almost because so it, ITC it, there's not an end game thing that you are playing for. There is not a bigger yeah. scoring element to the game. It is, here's what I have to accomplish this turn. And I'm setting myself up for my secondaries maybe every now and then, right? But not every single thing, not game long most of the time, unless it's, you yep. know, ground control or very, very few things, line breaker. But most of the time it's like, okay, I got to kill one. I got to hold one. I got to try to kill more. I got to try to hold more. If I accomplish that, I'm going to do pretty decent. And then the secondaries, you know, I can... That, that can trickle in here and there and be good to go. Like if you're an average player, right? And then if you're a super good player, you're going to try to max that stuff out in two turns and be done with it. And so then it's like, okay, if there's a long-term thing that's added it added onto it, but potentially simplifies the game in the, in the same thing. So I guess the way I look at it is the kill one, hold one should be secondary. Like I think that that is your, should be your secondary, like, missions is killing one holding one killing more holding more and i think that what is currently secondaries is your tertiaries like if you want to add that in the game that can be your tertiaries now the number of them that you need who knows maybe it's three maybe it's only two like who knows but then like i think that the primary objective needs to be something that is a little bit more bold and stand out like i said you know coming from esports and what people that are going to watch this are going to be your video game players they're going to be your rts players they're going to be those people and you know to draw their attention and they tune in and they go oh team deathmatch well the primary goal is to kill oh look that guy only has two units left i think he's winning because everything's dead oh it's capture the flag oh i can visibly see that there's a flag moved on that person's side of the board there's oh it's a seven inch floppy disk thing flopping across the board okay great. right so so it's like i i look at it as like uh, an additive primary that is more bold and stands out more like that is something that is needed for the competitive scene and that the mm -hmm. game modes literally need to be like it is capture the flag team deathmatch king of the hill whatever you know payload yeah. whatever those things are and then you have your secondaries and tertiaries and sure that might mean that there's more points that are able to be scored in a game but who cares does if it's 100 points a game does that matter at all no it doesn't um so I think that that adds a lot more value to like what could happen in a game. And it, it just makes it a little bit, I guess, um, you more didn't visible. Play, I mean, seven edition, did you? Yes. I have been playing for a long, long time. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Did you play ATC during? Seven no, edition? no, I didn't. Cause it was super out of my realm of being good. <laughs> so Thomas, I don't know if Damien did or not, but uh, Thomas, do you remember the last 7th edition missions for ATC? Um, golly. Um, He's asking so you to reach, reach back it's... into that neural cortex of yours and dig it out there. It, it, it's it's file 3674-443. Because 7th edition, that was like, that was two ATCs ago, right? 
<laughs> that was longer, man. We've had three ATCs under eight. Really? Three? <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah, so that's, cr that's crazy. My last missions that they did, but I actually was found like, like they were next to like as time has developed. Like I really wish I got to play more of those missions. So they had three primaries, okay? Uh, and then First Blood, Line Breaker, Slay the Warlord, you know, the basics. And each of those were worth one. But then the next thing you had was you had three primaries that were on during the entire time of the game. Mm -hmm. You had end game, you had kill points, and you had uh, progressives. Yeah. And each of those, you can score 10 max on them. Yeah, but I remember. You the tabletop, you were good at two of them. Your opponent was good at two of them. Both of y'all had one that you know, probably bad at right. and Joey like y'all are fighting you're trying to you know you're trying to maximize what you're good at while trying to minimize or while trying to uh exploit what your opponent's bad at mitigate right. yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. a lot of times those you know y'all both had one both y'all generally like have one in common that you're both very good at so you're you know the entire time you're gonna win this set what you're gonna you're gonna win that you're gonna win kill points because you have you know six art units in your army said so you're gonna win in-game objectives because you're super high sustained. But I'm gonna win progressive because I have a massive mile model. Okay? But you have a high sustain, so you're gonna be good at in-game, but I also have a lot of models that I can also be really good at in-game. Right. So the entire time you're gonna win kill points, I'm gonna win progressives, and then we're gonna fight over in-game. Um, and I really like that mechanic because you know it was a you know it was kind of like that best of free, you know, who could get the best of free. In a 40k game. Yeah. And I really like that. That was something that I was thinking about, you know, in 8th edition. I'm like, this would flow really well because, like, it punishes skewed lists, but it also, like, it really helps balance out good you know, lists. And you, in that idea, you play all, t all, you play early game, mid game, late game. Where sometimes in ITC, where, like, I've been building lists recently like that are... Gene Circle, the early game they don't give a crap about. Those first two turns, they're just saying, okay, we're not we're not playing in the game. And we're gonna decide to show up at the last moment and just we'll start winning the game. Yeah. Where in well, the ITC, you know, in, well, in you're ITC, gonna start trying to win the game. Let's get <laughs> right, you're gonna start uh, trying. Like, you're, gonna get, you're gonna start putting yourself in that position. <laughs> Where yeah. in the ITC, you know, in ITC, like, you know, People started developing those strategies where they're just going to give up the early game, which is impressive because the ITC is mostly like it's very early game based. Yeah, just right. kill the old one, getting those bonuses, getting those mores early in the game gives you a a little bit more room to a little bit more forgiveness in the mid to late game. Like you can you can make some screw up, let your opponent do some things without having super big consequences. But the end game really doesn't feel like it's in other than like super tight matches. It feels like it's really in ITC, where I, I like that three point system. Where like, okay, cool, we're gonna fight over something that we're both good at, and we're gonna try to see who wins that that third most important thing. Yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about how we could change things and, and things that would be really cool. I, I mean, I know we're this first go round, and we were doing ITC. Everyone loves ITC. We play a lot of ITC. That's the kind of the the standard that is spread across, you know, the country, you know, you go to an IT event, you pretty much know what you're, you're walking into. So, I mean, yeah. I think, you know, we're, we're doing that and we're going to do commentary and we're going to try to make it the best broadcast, the best thing you guys ever seen. And we're going to, we're going to head out some caches and a lot of prizes at the end of the day. So I think it's going to be fantastic, but you know, we're always kind of looking at how do we take 40 K to the masses? How do we make it more appealable to maybe not the, the person who plays 40k every day maybe someone who's never even heard of 40k and want them to actually sit there and watch a game and, and actually figure out what's going on so there may be an opportunity uh you know as we get more established and have a few more events under our belt to kind of say hey maybe we can tweak this you know format a little bit to make it more appealable to those masses yeah and honestly i think one of the best things we can do is you know after our first event like just come just try something right be like hey let's try this uh type of game mode with rule set like who cares maybe maybe we hit something on the head at some point you know doing some crazy stuff that everyone goes wow that was really that was really cool and then you know that like you can't you can't uh you know just write write up a bunch of stuff and be like oh let's do this without actually like trying anything so it's like hey you know there's this whole off season and stuff you know in between our events and lvo and then even after lvo till you know the next big events happen it's like Sure, ITC is the standard right now, and it is you know happening what it's happening. But 
um, there's always going to be room for iteration and changes and stuff like that. And thinking outside the box and developing something that, you know, the community may or may not like, but I think your diehard fans are going to adapt to whatever tournaments run. If they're going to, if they're going to go to a tournament, they're going to go to the tournament. You know what I mean? They're not, it doesn't matter what it, it's going to be mission setter rules, but for new people to get into it and to adapt it, it's the complete opposite. Um, it needs to be a little bit more friendly, I guess. Um, I, I do think, I do think you, I, I, I do want to kind of reiterate a little bit what you said, Thomas. I think it was very valid and good. Um, you know, this whole thing about what we're doing, just to kind of clarify to the masses as well, we'll be talking a lot and doing these podcasts. So you guys can tune in, you know, whenever we do this, but, um, we love ITC like, and we love Warzone. We love 40 K, right? That is just, that's right. All of us are super passionate about 40 K. So when we say, you know, we want to change this, we want to change that. It has nothing to do like all this, like we wouldn't even be able to even have this conversation we're having right now without all of this bulldozing of the trees that's been laid this foundation this beautiful foundation that's been laid by all of these different organizations and so like that's what that's what i think is really unique about pro tabletop we're in this spot where we love everything there's nothing that we are necessarily super attached to in a way like we want to pull from all these different keep our hands in all these lovely pies and like so I, I just don't want anybody to take away from us saying, you know, we'd change this, we'd change that. Like, I, I, and I just like what Thomas said. I just kind of wanted to reiterate it a little bit about that just to say, like, man, like, we, we are so, we're very humbled to be in this spot. We're very grateful to, and, and I also want you guys to know that Brad has put a redonkulous amount of work into this. Like, I, you guys, uh, so in supporting Brad and, and like, kind of, he's the, he's, this is his baby, you know, we just are tagging along, basically. I mean, we're a part of it, but, like, we, he has, and I want to, you know, publicly thank Brad as well. Thomas and I have talked a lot about this. Like, Brad has spent so many hours trying to make this the most amazing fun hit you in the teeth kind of tournament that the world has never seen before and he's gonna and I, I think it's gonna be a success and so I just yeah like all around like super positive things super great and I think this is just gonna be it's gonna be man the, the creme de la creme will rise up and we will see in a few years who are the absolute best 40k players in the world well, thanks for that, Damien. Oh, you're so so touching. Don't make me cry. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I mean, it's not something where we are trying to change anything. It's just you know, I like to openly talk and put my thoughts out there because I think that it's there's never a problem with people from the outside coming in and giving their thoughts and opinions on how anything is. And it's like, right? If if all these rules of of stuff has always been developed around what competitive 40k is or what 40k is um you know looking at it from the outside and saying well why is the competitive scene not growing faster or why is it how big can the competitive scene grow or how can it be more watchable or how can because like you have every single pro player that you know says or top player that says they can't even watch 40k streams like they don't watch the tournaments because it's unviewable it's ununderstandable it's boring so right so it's like I come from the 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 esports and broadcast background and what I think about is that viewership and what engages the people and what makes them watch and from a video game standpoint it's a lot easier there's still a lot of hard things there but it is easier to grab people's attention but you know it is like it there there's always room to adapt and and at some point there's probably going to be something that says you know from a pure research standpoint that says if you change this one thing in competitive 40K, it is going to drive engagement and viewership X amount. And if it is like this like clearly stated statistic driven thing, nobody can argue it. You know what I mean? And, and like the easiest starting point is you look at like bat reps and you say, look at how different bat reps are filmed on YouTube and which ones get the bigger views. It's because they're, yep. they're easily follow, followable they're of high quality and they make more sense. So it's like, when you compare that there, there's, it's like, here's a shitty bat rep. Here's an okay bat rep. Here's a really, really highly produced bat rep that they've, they've researched what people like to watch and why they like to watch it. What graphics are needed, what flow is needed. 
what time limit people like to watch. Like, is three hours too long for a game from a viewer standpoint? Fuck yes, it is. It is way too long, 110%. Now, is that something that we can change right now? No, it's not because the community would cry in an uproar about it. But over time, if things are developed for the game to run faster and smoother, that time can come down and you won't even notice a difference. And a perfect example of that is... Um, this like the gig this uh event that I played at Giga a couple weeks ago. It was not a super super competitive thing. You know, that's what everyone says, but then everybody shows up with their super competitive list because it's fucking Giga, let's be real. You can't go there without a competitive list. And you know, the the time was two and a half hours. And like, I mean, I finished every single game, every single round. There was no problems. And you know, it felt like it was moving a lot faster, like the start time. Yeah, but you were also the... getting tabled by turn three every game. What? What? I was top table last round, mother. Hey, shots fired. I was on that top table going in. I was on it, and then I got, I lost, but it's okay. You had your moment. I had my moment, yeah. But, I mean, it's just it's just my point. Like, I think that if you can get the time down in between that two and a two and a half hour mark, it's going to be the sweet spot for viewership. And I think that two hour mark is like the ideal spot for a viewership. But from a player playing standpoint, right now that's physically not possible. But as rules develop and as missions, you know, change and stuff like that, I think that there is ways to do it. And for example, like the way we're doing deployment and the way we're doing mission select and all that stuff, it, it, it speeds up time. Yes, we're allowing, you know, 10 minutes for all that pregame stuff, but like, you can bake all that in. You can make it less and less. And honestly, people complain that three hours is like not enough time or whatever for playing. Well, when you take 30 minutes to deploy your freaking army, yes. like you're literally playing for two and a half hours. Yeah. So it's it's an irrelevant point at that at that point in time. So that's all I got. But yeah, we can wrap this up. We went a little bit longer than we wanted to. So. Well, one more thing to give you Go a little ahead. bit of credit was you talked about in the beginning, you know, like I'm putting all this out there and like wanting to talk to the community and building on that part. We play a game of communication. And that goes to show that, you know, like just as a both, you know, part of character, but also just like you're going in a good direction because that's what we already do. We already play a game of communication. That's the main part of this game. We cannot communicate. We cannot play the game. So talking to other people and asking you opinions and this and that, getting all that feedback is a great way of saying, hey, look, this is a good direction to go in because we already do that as players. That's something we should all be able to do. And I just want to give you credit. That's, that, that may like sit there and I'm like, you know, having people that talk to the community, having TOs that are going out there and, you know, communicating, asking for feedback and sometimes getting both negative and positive, like, that's, you know, that's all great. And that's a key part. And you have some people that don't do that. And they just like, all of a sudden like, hey, look, we're making this ruling out of nowhere. And I saw everyone else play this way. I'm like, no, we don't. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're, you're, you're right, like Mark. Mean, ruling. Well, look at the difference between GW's standpoint on the community, how they used to be and how they are now, right? I think you yeah. make a great point. Like, everybody, like, I mean, they get pissed at GW, but at the same time, like the amount of compliments towards GW on doing the FAQs and just listening to the public and like they go out there, they go to tournaments, you know what I mean? They're really participating in, in everybody being around, which is, and it makes a huge difference to the players. Yep. Bingo, Talk dingo. To GW. Yep. That's, yeah. So, that's I mean, I so just to kind of wrap it up, uh, you know, Monday, tomorrow, you know, I, I, I'm going to be gone again. I'm work is taking me away, but we're going to have some folks on the stream. Brad, you have a kind of a wrap up of who's going to be there, what's going to go on. Uh, me and Damien are going to be playing. I'm playing Eldar, and I promoted Damien's playing Knights, but then he changed it to Admech. So who knows what he's actually I said playing? Admech, I said Admech and Knights. Oh, both. Oh, okay. That's what I was trying oh, to say. Okay. Both. God. Yeah, I need I need command points. What so Same will give me thing. Command points. So <laughs> then, um, so that's good to know. And uh, I think Daniel's I'll gonna come out and I'll do some stuff on the mic. Volume. So, yeah, so uh, if you're if you're I don't know if Monday Price night, is coming come... out. I don't know if anybody else is, but Daniel's said he's gonna stop by and commentate some. Um, we'll probably try a little bit different style of more of us mic'd up with like fill-ins and stuff like that in between matches, and Daniel just kind of hanging out with Chad and keeping up with Chad and stuff like that. But um, to just try to 
you know, different formats out so then we could get, get down exactly what, what works and, and everything. And obviously these Monday nights are casual. They're not at all what it's going to be like when we do our big broadcasts at our events or anything like that. Um, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. It's going to be 5 30 PM Eastern. Thanks for tuning in everybody today, guys. If there's anything else you need, email us, hit us up on Facebook, anything like that. Make sure to follow our channel and support us in any way you can. Appreciate all the love. Thank you guys. Thanks, fellas. And females. And ladies. Boy.